So welcome everyone to episode six of Philosopher Meets Critics, our roundtable discussion organized by the Federal University of Bahia and the Cologne Center for Contemporary Epistemology and the Kantian Tradition. So far, we had very insightful and fun discussions and I'm sure we will add another one today. We're very honored and happy to present Declan Smithies, um, professor at the University of um, at the Ohio State University. And Declan's research um, mainly focuses on uh, epistemology and the philosophy of mind and the paths where these two areas cross. Today, he will present his book, The Epistemic Role of Consciousness, which was published by Oxford University Press in September 2019. And again, today we have three critics who will comment on uh, this book. Very welcome, Alex Byrne, head of the Department of Linguistics and Philosophy at MIT. Brie Gertler, professor at the University of Virginia and Hilary Kornbluff, professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Thank you all for taking your precious time and I think you can start right away with the presentation Declan. So please go ahead. So thanks very much to uh, Waldo and Lewis for the invitation. And thanks especially to Alex and Brie and Hilary for agreeing to join the conversation today. I'm lucky to have three of my favorite philosophers commenting on the book. So here's the, here's the cover. And the question that the book seeks to answer is this, what's the significance of phenomenal consciousness? Um, what role does it play in our lives? And does it play any role that um, couldn't be played without phenomenal consciousness. So to make this question vivid, I engage in a kind of thought experiment. Suppose we all suddenly became zombies, that is creatures with no phenomenal consciousness. What, um, if anything, would we have lost? Would, would we thereby be guaranteed to lose anything of significance? Well, you might wonder if, if we lose experience, are we still able to navigate the world? But I think it's at least conceivable that we could um, continue to get around the world just fine without conscious experience. So imagine you're what's sometimes known as a, a functional zombie who can function pretty much as before. It's just that you've lost conscious experience. There's nothing it's like to be you anymore. And one reaction would be to say, well, if you can get around just fine, if you can do everything you could do beforehand, then it's not clear that you have lost anything of significance. But there are a few strands in the literature that suggest that no, phenomenal consciousness has a kind of significance that can't be traced to its function. Um, so in particular, Charles Seward argues in his book, The Significance of Consciousness, that consciousness has a kind of evaluative significance. It makes life worth living. Um, few of us would choose to become zombies, even if, we could still get around the world because we'd have lost one of the things that makes life worth living. We could still go through the motions, but um, it wouldn't be quite so enjoyable anymore. A similar line of thought can be found in the work of Peter Singer, who argues that consciousness has moral significance. It makes your life matter morally. And so a big part of his argument that we shouldn't eat animals depends on the idea that animals can suffer. They can feel pleasure, they can feel pain. Uh, and were that not the case, if we focus, for example, in an insect, a, a rich source of protein, but with no capacity for consciousness, there his, his argument against eating the insect would not apply, um, since the insect, assuming the insect lacks uh, consciousness. Well, my book is not really about these evaluative issues. Indeed, I suspect that this tells us more about the significance of a particular kind of consciousness, namely effective consciousness. In any case, my question is, is a bit more specific. Does consciousness play any significant role in our mental lives? So here are a few um, ideas in the literature about the significance of consciousness for our mental life. John Searle and many others have argued that consciousness has representational significance. It enables us to represent the world. So that if we became zombies, we'd lose our capacity for representation our minds would no longer be about anything. 
A similar idea can be found in the work of John Campbell, who argues that consciousness has cognitive significance. Maybe it's not required for all forms of representation, but it's, um, it enables us to think about the world. And zombies on this view couldn't think about the world, though they might represent it in other ways. The view that I defend in the book is that consciousness has a kind of epistemic significance. It gives us uh, knowledge of the world. And indeed, um, without consciousness, we couldn't have knowledge of the world. So um, this then bears on the epistemic lives of, of zombies. Um, according to the view defended in the book, zombies have no knowledge of themselves or the world around them. Why not? It's not that they can't represent the world. So the view is rather different from the view defended by John Searle and others. On this view, zombies can represent the world. Their representation of motivational states can play a role in explaining their behavior. Indeed, I suspect it's very hard to explain their behavior without imputing representational and motivational states. And more generally, I think it's very hard to explain the behavior of the zombie systems within us. For example, the unconscious systems that control action without imputing mental representations to them. But I claim these mental representations can't provide justification for belief or action because they are neither conscious nor even, inex nor even accessible to consciousness. They're inaccessible to consciousness. And things get, uh, get worse for the poor zombies because if we, if we think about their mental life, I argue that they don't even perceive or believe anything. Um, why not? Well, their mental representations do play the right kind of causal role. They play a causal role, I'm assuming, that's isomorphic to the causal role played by our beliefs and perceptions. The point is that they play the wrong kind of normative role since they don't provide justification for belief. So if, um, if we understand perception and belief in terms of their role, and if we think that role includes epistemic roles, like providing knowledge, or justification for belief about the world, then the idea is these mental representations are not playing the right kind of role to qualify as perceptions or beliefs. And so the upshot is that a kind of functionalist analysis of perception and cognition stands or falls with the prospects for a functional analysis of phenomenal consciousness. And if you're the sort of person like me who tends to think that a functional zombie is at least conceivable, and so we cannot give a functional analysis of phenomenal consciousness. Then given these connections, um, this puts pressure on a functional analysis of perception and cognition too, um, which is interesting because a number of philosophers, including Ned Block, have thought that even if functionalism fails as a theory of phenomenal consciousness, it can succeed as a theory of cognition. And part of the, part of the goal of the book is to try to put some pressure on that kind of bifurcationism about the mind. So, so far I've just been sort of stating the position of the book without really making any effort to motivate it. So um, let me briefly sketch some of the uh, more intuitive motivations for the view. Starting with the case of blindsight, um, which is a real phenomenon but could, could be regarded as a kind of partial zombification. So in effect in blindsight we remove conscious experience while leaving some of its causal functions intact. Maybe not all of the, maybe not all of its causal functions, but the ones that are not left intact, we can gradually reintroduce through a series of thought experiments. So the idea is subjects with blind sight cannot experience objects and properties in their blind field, but they can nevertheless act on them, for example, pointing at a spot of light, catching a stick, navigating around obstacles in a crowded hallway, and of course, issuing reliable reports about stimuli in the blind field. But now we can ask, does unconscious visual information in blind sight provide justification for belief? And here my inclination is to think it doesn't. Um, so how do, how do we motivate this? Well, one way is to consider a thought experiment where we, as it were, put yourself in the predicament of the blind sight. So imagine that while you're sleeping, a neuroscientist implants a mechanism in your brain that accurately detects conditions outside the visual field, for example, conditions behind your head. And now when you wake up, um, 
You find to your surprise that you can reliably give the right answer when the doctor holds up a hand behind your head and asks, how many fingers am I holding up? You can reliably give the right answer um, as a result of this mechanism that's been implanted. Now we can ask, do you have any justification to believe that she's holding up three fingers? And it seems to me at least very intuitive that the answer is yes, when you can see them and no, when uh, the hand is held outside of your visual field behind, behind your head. Notwithstanding the fact that this uh, mechanism in your brain can in some sense see the hand contains a reliable source of information which can be used in guessing, maybe in certain forms of action. So let's go back to the blind side here, and I'm gonna to try to uh, give something of an argument, This uh, call this the argument from below, that the blind sight uh, subject doesn't have justification um, coming from unconscious vision. So the first premise in the argument is, is sort of the empirical observation that blind sight subjects are not in fact disposed to form beliefs non-inferentially about the blind field. Um, so they, they don't use their unconscious visual information in this way, rather they, they withhold belief about what's going on in the blind field. They'll typically make guesses about what's going on when forced to, but will it express surprise when they learn of their reliability. But they won't form beliefs about what's going on, um, at least without engaging in uh, complex forms of inference. So they're not simply relying on unconscious visual information. The second premise is that there's nothing irrational about this. Blindsighted subjects are not thereby any less than fully rational. Blindside isn't really a, a cognitive deficit at all, but a perceptual one. So I think it's, it's better to think of what's going on. It's not that they have perceptual evidence that they're not using, but rather they're lacking certain forms of perceptual evidence that we would typically have. So the third premise is a kind of linking premise. If con unconscious visual information in blindsight does provide a source of non-inferential justification for belief, then blindsight subjects are less than fully rational insofar as they fail to use it, insofar as they refrain from forming beliefs non-inferentially on the basis of this unconscious visual information and withholding belief instead. And so putting these premises together, we get the conclusion that unconscious visual information in blind sight doesn't provide a source of non-inferential justification for belief. But now one, one point I've highlighted is that these patients don't um, in fact form beliefs about the blind field. What if they did? Would that make a difference? Would it make a difference if, if they were disposed to form beliefs non-inferentially on the basis of unconscious visual information, as in Bloch's example of super blind sight or some kind of uh, variation thereon? And it seems to me that the answer is, is no, for the reason that um, simply adding a disposition to form beliefs about the blind field can't be enough to make their beliefs justified. So if, if the reliable visual information in blind sight was not already enough to justify beliefs about the blind field, then simply adding a disposition to form beliefs on that basis can't be enough to supply justification where we didn't have justification before. So if this is right, um, what it gives us is a counterexample to reliabilism, where reliabilism is roughly speaking the view that a belief is justified if and only if it's formed on the basis of a reliable disposition. Where well, the counterexample is that the super blind sighter isn't justified in forming beliefs about the blind field, although his beliefs are formed on the basis of a reliable disposition. And so understood, of course, the case is structurally parallel to some of the classic um, counterexamples to reliabilism, like Bonjour's example of Norman the Clairvoyant and Keith Lehrer's example of Mr. Trutem. Maybe the key twist, the key difference here is that the, reflecting on the super blind sight case, I think brings out the epistemic role of consciousness in a much clearer way than the more familiar counterexamples. And if you, if you read the work of Bonjour and Lehrer, the key lesson drawn from their examples is not a lesson about the epistemic role of consciousness, um, 
but, but rather different lessons in, in each case. So I think um, what's nice about this example, although it's structurally similar to the classic ones, it um, in a very vivid way brings out um, why consciousness seems epistemologically important. Now, of course, um, a proponent of reliabilism isn't necessarily going to give in quite so easily. They might well say, well, look, my theory says that um, beliefs that are formed on the basis of reliable dispositions are indeed justified. Since the super blind sighters beliefs satisfy that condition, why not say they are justified? What's so wrong with biting the bullet here? Um, so here I want to try to give an argument from above to put a little bit of extra pressure on that kind of response. This argument appeals to the JJ principle, which figures um, very centrally in the book. So this says that um, you have justification to believe a proposition P if and only if you have higher order justification to believe that you have justification to believe that P. And so the idea is that with this principle in play, we can reflect at the second order on what it's like to be the super blind sighter. But bear in mind the super blind sighter has no knowledge of this unconscious visual information. They don't have a kind of internal form of blind sight. Um, and we can imagine that they haven't been around long enough to sort of figure out inductively that they have this um, representational source either. So um, it seems that we can suppose the super blind sighter lacks higher order justification to believe that she has any justification to believe there's an X in her blind field. And so by the JJ principle, it follows that she lacks justification at the first order to believe that there's an X in her blind field. Well, now the standard response on behalf of a reliabilist is likely to be to reject the JJ principle at this point. But I think this um, has its own um, uncomfortable consequences. So why accept the JJ principle? The thought in the book is that we need it to explain the irrationality of epistemic acrasia, which is roughly the phenomenon of holding beliefs you think you shouldn't hold, analogously to the way acratic action involves acting in ways you think you shouldn't act. And one of the characteristics of epi epistemic acratic agents is that they believe the conjuncts of Morian sounding conjunctions like these, there's an X in my blind field, but I don't have justification to believe this. So suppose we reject JJ and we say the super blind sighter has um, justification to believe P, where P is there's an X in my blind field, but doesn't have justification to believe they have justification to believe that. Well, it's left open that they might have justification to believe this conjunction or perhaps this one, there's an X in my blind field, but it's an open question whether I have justification to believe this. Um, and arguably, um, you can't have justification to believe uh, these uh, conjunctions. In so far as you're justified in believing the second conjunct, you're no longer justified in believing the first. You should give up your belief that there's an X in the blind field once um, you have justification to believe either that you lack justification to believe it or even that it's an open question whether you have justification to believe it. Um, so there's more to be said about the JJ principle, but I think we can use it in putting some pressure on a reliabilist response to um, the super blind sight case. Suppose we do accept the JJ principle as, as I'm inclined to do. Um, how are we to explain it? Well, the thought here is that um, conscious experience um, plays an important role in explaining why the JJ principle is true. So let's just take a standard case of visual experience um, where my uh, visual experience gives me justification to believe that I have hands. Well, the thought is that I thereby have justification to believe the following. By introspection, I have justification to believe a proposition about my own experience namely that it visually seems that I have hands and um, that I have no defeaters. On the basis of a priori reasoning, I have justification to believe an epistemic principle of something like the following form. If it visually seems that I have hands and I have no defeaters, then I have justification to believe that I have hands. And so by deduction from these premises, I have justification to believe that I have justification to believe that I have hands. Um, so um, this structure guarantees that whenever my experience justifies a belief about the external world, my experience also justifies 
uh, the higher order proposition that I have justification to believe this proposition. And so conscious experience is playing an essential role in explaining the JJ principle. So what's special about consciousness? Why do we need consciousness for the explanation? Um, well, well, here's the idea. Consciousness is special because it does a kind of epistemic double duty. It justifies beliefs about the external world while also justifying beliefs about itself. And that's what um, um, enables that explanation I just presented to go through. Uh, and this is, this is really how consciousness is supposed to explain the irrationality of epistemic acrasia. And I claim nothing else can do this kind of epistemic uh, double duty. Nothing else that is except belief. So let me just briefly comment on belief since I think this, this will come up in the discussion to follow. Um, but on the, on the view that I defend in the book, although belief is not itself a phenomenally conscious episode, it's a dispositional state, it's nevertheless disposed to cause phenomenally conscious episodes of judgment. So there's an important link between belief and consciousness. Um, and more than that, the contents of belief are accessible to phenomenal consciousness as the contents of judgment. Is that there's a very tight connection here. The contents of a judgment don't simply coincide with the contents that we believe, but they express what we believe. Our judgments express what we believe. Um, and I argue that that's because, and indeed only because, belief is individuated by its phenomenal dispositions. It is a disposition to judge. To believe a proposition is to be disposed to judge it. And it's because that's what belief is. It's because belief in effect inherits its content from the contents of the judgments it's disposed to cause that we can say that judgments express what we believe rather than merely coinciding with what we believe. Um, so it, this is an important point for me because I want not only our current experiences to play in an epistemic world, but our standing beliefs too. And um, there's some, some difficulty in, in maintaining that position, but uh, I, I believe it can be done. Uh, uh, although, as I say, there are difficulties here. So let me just briefly end by sketching the big picture there. So I call the view phenomenal accessibilism, and it's really... Um, I suppose it's got three main ingredients. The first ingredient is phenomenal mentalism, which is a kind of supervenience or determination thesis that says necessarily which propositions you have justification to believe at any given time is determined solely by the phenomenally individuated facts about your mental states at that time. And the phenomenally individuated facts about your mental states are basically the facts about your phenomenal experiences and your phenomenal disposition. So this is going to include facts about your beliefs as well as your current experiences. The next plank is what I call the simple theory of introspection, which has the consequence that you're always in a position to know the phenomenally individuated facts about your mental states at any given time. The idea here is there are certain facts about your mental states that just supply reasons for belief about themselves. Uh, in particular, all the phenomenally facts, phenomenally individuated facts about your mental states give you introspective reasons to believe that those facts obtain. And these reasons are strong enough to put you in a position to know that those facts obtain. Um, and if we put these two things together, then we have a way of defending a, an accessibilist theory of justification, which says you're always in a position to know which propositions you have justification to believe at any given time. So we can kind of move from the bottom up or from the top down. Um, from the bottom up, we could um, explain how an accessibilist theory of justification could be true by appealing to the conjunction of phenomenal mentalism with the simple theory of introspection. Or we could argue from the top down by giving independent arguments for accessibilism and thereby arguing for the conjunction of phenomenal mentalism and the simple theory of introspection by a kind of philosophical inference to the best explanation. Now, of course, there are many important challenges um, for this view, and I think the um, power of these challenges accounts for the unpopularity of this sort of view in the recent literature. Uh, 
So these include empirical challenges to the reliability of introspection and higher order reflection of the kind recently uh, pressed very powerfully by Eric Schwitzkebel and Hilary Kornblith, among others. Um, it also includes more, more sort of purely armchair philosophical arguments against uh, the idea that anything can be luminous and against iteration principles like the KK principle and the JJ principle of the kind that um, Williamson um, presses in his book, Knowledge and Its Limits. So there are many important challenges. And in the second part of the book, I try to address these as, as best I can. But it's worth asking, um, what should we take from these challenges? If we can't answer them, should we conclude that epistemic acrasia is not always irrational after all? Well, that is a view that is now being explored by many in the literature, almost as if we're pushed in this direction by the power of these challenges. But I think it is important to, to recognize that that's a, um, a significant cost, and it's worth asking whether it's a cost we have to pay. So without going into the detail of my response to these challenges, here's um, the last thing I'll say, we'll just to sort of sketch the, um, the overall strategy of my reply, which is to appeal to a point about epistemic idealization. So human rationality is of course very imperfect. We can be more or less rational, but we cannot achieve uh, rational perfection. Um, Perfect rationality, I'm assuming, is, is very demanding. So for example, if it requires deductive consistency and closure, as is often assumed in formal theories of rationality, or if it um, just assumes probabilistic coherence, either way, it's also going to require logical omniscience, which is of course something that humans, um, none of us achieve, and indeed none of us, I think, are seriously capable of achieving. Um, Nevertheless, it's often thought that logical omniscience can function as something like a rational ideal for us. And so the thought is that evidential omniscience is a rational perfection on par with logical omniscience. It's a kind of ideal of rationality. And it, admittedly, it's not an ideal that humans meet or are capable of meeting. But nevertheless, the thought is uh, it can structure our thinking about what it would be to be ideally rational. Um, and it's an ideal that humans can approximate to some degree, and we can evaluate each other in terms of whether, and to the, the extent to which um, we approximate this ideal. So that's enough to sketch the big picture. Let me, let me leave it there and turn it over to the critics. Thank you very much, Declan. Um, Alex, would you like to give your first, the first comment? Uh, sure. Um... Okay, let me share my screen. Uh, okay, yeah, so it's a great honor to uh, comment on this terrific book. I only have 10 minutes, I think. Um, I, I hope you, it's okay if I run over by a minute or, or two. I just want to make um, uh, a brief defense of Williamson's thesis that E equals K, that your evidence is your knowledge against uh, Declan's attack. So as um, uh, Declan says, he defends mentalism and in particular phenomenal mentalism. All the um, text on the slides is from Declan's uh, book, chapter six, unless it's in a box. So phenomenal mentalism, Declan says, is the view that epistemic justification is determined solely by your phenomenally individuated mental states. These include not only your conscious experiences, which, indivi in, which are individuated by their phenomenal character, but also your consciously accessible beliefs, which are individuated by their phenomenal dispositions. So on Declan's view, if we assume the, the standard picture of um, a brain in a vat, um, here's Declan and here's Declan's invatted twin. They are phenomenal duplicates, at least on the standard conception. And so on Declan's view, they are equally justified. 
in believing a variety of propositions. Now, what's epistemic justification? To uh, Declan's great credit, he spends some time answering this question. Um, and in so doing, he adopts, at least for the purposes of the book, an evidentialist framework. Evidentialism says that epistemically justified beliefs are evidentially likely to be true in the sense that they are probable given your evidence. Evidentialism explains epistemic justification in terms of what your evidence supports. So he says, on a probabilistic conception of evidential support, the, de the degree to which a proposition is supported by your evidence is given by its evidential probability, that is, by its probab probability conditional upon your evidence. Okay, now uh, Declan makes a distinction between two senses of evidence that he gets from Jim Pryor. Your evidence in the justification making sense is constituted by the contingent facts that determine which propositions you have justification to believe. In contrast, your evidence in the justification showing sense is constituted by the propositions you have justification to believe, which you are thereby rationally permitted to use as premises in reasoning to further conclusions. In effect, your evidence can be defined either as the facts that make propositions evident to you, or as the propositions that are thereby made evident to you. Both conceptions of evidence are perfectly legitimate, but conflating them can lead to serious confusion. And this is part of his diagnosis of what's go, what goes wrong with the E equals K argument. Unless I explicitly say otherwise, Declan continues, I will use the term evidence in the justification making sense rather than the justification showing sense. Okay, so I don't agree that both conceptions of evidence are perfectly legitimate. So let me now explain why. So suppose Declan is justified in believing that there is a cat before him. Call that proposition, the proposition that there is a cat before him, P. What makes Declan justified? Well, um, this distinction between justification making evidence and justification, show, and justification showing evidence is not supposed to presuppose mentalism or phenomenal mentalism or any uh, particular theory of um, what makes you justified in believing things or any particular view of what evidence in the justification showing sense is. It's supposed to be this neutral distinction that all theorists uh, should sign on to. So we may suppose that the, that the fact that makes Declan justified is something about his brain, something about the fact that he's in brain state B. So what makes him justified in believing that there's a cat before him on this view, which you could turn into a kind of reliabilism, but not necessarily, is um, something about his brain states. It's the fact that he's in brain state B and blah, 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 some other stuff, call that Q. Q, the fact that Q uh, makes Declan justified in believing that there's a cat before him. Okay, so uh, the, the first worry is that um, there's no guarantee, we'd have to look into the details, um, that Q supports P. But more importantly, um, Q supports Q because on uh, Declan's view of evidential support, um, it's um, explained in terms of uh, epistemic probability and the probability of Q in, in particular, um, in terms of conditional epistemic probability and the probability of Q given Q provided that the probability of Q is not zero is one. So Q supports Q, but surely Declan is not just because he's in this 
particular position, he sees the cat, he's justified in believing that there's a cat before him, surely he is not justified in believing some fact about his brain states. He might not even know he has a brain. So it seems to me that your justification making evidence is not your evidence. It just isn't some sense of evidence. The only sense of evidence is the justification showing sense. Now it happens, and I think this is why Declan didn't really engage with this worry in the book. It happens that on Declan's brand of mentalism, it turns out that all so-called justification making evidence is justification showing evidence. But that of course doesn't by itself show that justification making evidence is itself um, a kind of evidence. It just turns out that on Declan's idiosyncratic view um, of justification, um, the, thing, um, the thing that he calls justification making evidence does indeed turn out to be um, a genuine kind of, uh, of evidence, namely the justification showing kind. So justification making evidence is not a legitimate conception of, of evidence as far as I can see. All right, now let me turn to um, uh, E equals K. And of course, as Declan recognizes, he must resist E equals K. So here we have, um, whoops, sorry about that. Uh, sorry, let me go back to the, there we go. Um, here we have Declan and his invatted twin and on Declan's view, they have the very same evidence. But of course, on anyone's view, they don't have the same knowledge. The invatted guy's knowledge is greatly impoverished compared to Declan's knowledge. In other words, K dagger, the invatted guy's knowledge is not identical to K, Declan's non invatted knowledge. In other words, um, E does not equal K if Declan is right. Okay, so he has to resist the argument for E equals K and this is the way Declan sets it out. Premise one, only known facts are evidence. Premise two, all known facts are evidence. Conclusion, all and only known facts are evidence. And Declan says, the apparent plausibility of this argument depends on conflating two concepts of evidence. Each premise is plausibly true given mine revisions, but on different interpretations of the concept of evidence, there is no univocal concept of evidence on which both premises are true. Um, I am just going to ignore the bit about the minor revisions. Okay, so here's Declan against premise one, only known facts are evidence. He says, I reject this claim because facts about your experience can give you justification to believe their contents, whether or not you know that they obtain. These facts about your experience are included in your evidence because they play a justification making role. In other words, Declan is saying, well, I reject premise one because um, in the justification making sense, it isn't true that only known facts are evidence. But as just argued, uh, justification making evidence is not a legitimate conception of evidence. So the only sense of evidence in play, according to me, is the justification showing uh, sense of evidence. And it's true that uh, Declan does have some complaints against premise one understood in the justification showing sense, we don't have time to get into that, unfortunately. Let me just um, uh, offer a consideration in favor of premise one. I'd like to, to see what uh, Declan thinks of it. So here's an argument for premise one. <laughs> Whoops, struck that. Okay, premise one, if P is part of one's evidence, it is permissible to share in particular to assert P. So if I have 
some uh, proposition um, in my body of evidence, then surely it's at least permissible for me to tell Declan what it is. In other words, it's permissible for me, I'm not doing anything wrong, epistemically speaking, if I assert P to Declan. That's the first premise. The second premise is just the knowledge norm, norm of assertion as defended by Williamson and others. It is permissible to assert P only if one knows P. So the conclusion is then that if P is part of one's evidence, one knows P. Okay, so finally, to go back to the argument for E equals K, premise one, only known facts are evidence. Premise two, all known facts are evidence. Conclusion, therefore all and only known facts are evidence. Uh, Declan accepts two, I think, um, with evidence understood in the evidence showing sense. And we've just argued for one, uh, therefore E equals K. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Declan, I believe you want to respond right away or? That'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah. Uh, okay. And Alex, ahead. this material wouldn't have made it into the book without, without you. So I, I'm grateful and it's a privilege to discuss this with you now. Um, so it's a really good, it's a great challenge. So this brain state B makes it the case that I have justification to believe there's a cat in front of me. Um, but is this fact that I'm in B included in my evidence? That seems like an odd thing to say, especially given that I don't actually have justification to believe that I'm in B. And uh, Alex is using this to put pressure on the idea that um, I've really identified a legitimate conception of evidence in this um, justification making sense. Um, so a few thoughts in response. Now, I'm not myself inclined to make this move, but if the experience is identical to brain state B, I can imagine a theorist who's inclined to say, well, if the one is justification making evidence, so is the other. Perhaps we can get around this by just, by taking something that is doing the making it the case work without being identical to the experience. So something that- Sure, yeah. Sure. Yeah. The experience. Um, Grounding, maybe. Right, exactly. Um, and it does seem like, so at this point, it's still going to look pretty gnarly to say this fact is part of your justification making evidence. One reaction would just be to junk the notion entirely, which is in effect what Alex is recommending. My inclination is try to find restrictions. So suppose this grounding fact is a fact about, you know, the totality of the microphysical facts in the universe. You know, surely that is not uh, part of my evidence. Um, but there it seems to include too much. So we want some kind of minimality condition. If it's, uh, it also seems sort of too far down the chain of grounding. So maybe we need some proximality condition. Um, at least I think these, these things are worth playing around with. Of course, uh, the move I want to make, Alex has already alluded to, which is to say the kind of restriction we need is an epistemic restriction. So for something to be part of your justification making evidence, it's also got to be part of your justification showing evidence. In other words, it has to be a fact that you have justification to believe. Otherwise it's, it's excluded. Um, and that, that will, of course, exclude the fact that I'm in brain state B on the assumption that I, I don't have justification to believe that fact. But Alex, I think, rightly points out that, you know, that might be fine as a response for me to give, but it does make it a little unfortunate that now this notion of justification making evidence might be one for a theorist like me to uh, adopt, but I, I would not have made the case more generally that any theorist should adopt it. So I wonder if I can do better here. And now I'm very much thinking on my feet. Um, so, so what is that? What is the rationale for that claim that all justification um, making evidence must also be justification showing evidence? Well, the way I motivate it in the book is by appeal to luminosity, which is in a way a fringe commitment of my theory. So for your evidence 
is um, has to be luminous in the sense that you're always in a position to know what your evidence is. And as a result, you always have justification to believe that evidence. Um, is there a way to motivate this constraint without appeal to luminosity? Well, here's a thought. Um, there's a strain of thinking about evidence that you find even in the e equals k camp on which not anything that plays the justification showing ro role is part of your evidence, but only the most basic things. The, 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 you might, if you like, call this your, your basic evidence. Um, they're the things that, that provide you with justification and are sort of the most basic things you have justification to believe. And if you combine my picture with a kind of classical foundationalism, then in effect what you have is this other way of motivating the thought that your justification making evidence is justification showing evidence because it's playing this basicality role. Um, so, um, yeah, why? Sorry, go yeah. on. No, jump in at that point. Sorry. I, I, so, yeah, so I, I was thinking about that. So why, would your picture be just ruined if you accepted E equals K, but said, well, um, the, uh, the foundational layer of evidence, the evidence on which everything else is, is built is knowledge of the, of the phenomenal. So now we agree that the brain in a vat has less evidence than the unvatted, uh, the unvatted Declan, but the brain in the vat has the, the very same level of foundational uh, evidence as, uh, as you outside the vat. Good, yeah. It's would, that, would, it, would that just completely spoil, would that just completely spoil your picture or? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think that the problem only really emerges when we turn our attention from the foundations to the superstructure, because there is something very E equals K-ish about my, my view of the foundations. In fact, it's sort of, it's supercharged yeah. E equals K. It's um, E equals luminous. Um, your evidence is, is not just the knowable facts, but the luminous facts. And so the worry in effect is that if we had the, um, merely the um, knowability requirement too much would be included. Um, so it, in fact, maybe the problem arises either way. So there would be too much for the foundational knowledge because if we included everything knowable, then we'd be in including not just your basic knowledge, but your non-basic knowledge. So that would be the problem for the, um, for the kind of basic evidence. What about the non-basic kind? So here, Alex, my, um, the interesting argument you give um, for E equals K relies crucially on this premise that um, it's permissible to assert P or to use P as a premise in reasoning only if you know it. And I suppose my thought there is that that's too constraining for a couple of reasons. One, even if you don't believe it, so long as it's knowable, it ought to be in some sense permissible for you to use it because it's permissible for you to believe it. Um, if it's knowable, then uh, you really should believe it and so should um, assert it and use it as a premise. Yeah, this is the sort of minor revision right. that, that, I, that I said I would ignore. Yeah, so um, let's yeah, pass over that. Right. Um, but yeah, I suppose more importantly, there is this, and we'll probably disagree on this, but my thought is that it can also be permissible to use propositions in reasoning that are false. Um, yeah, no, no, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand that, but that's why I put, because I don't think you, you talk about this in the book. Um, you, you certainly do say that, yes, your view is that you can use false propositions. There's nothing wrong with using a false proposition in, in reasoning. So that's why I put it in terms of um, assertion and sharing. Uh -huh. uh, so what about what about the knowledge norm of assertion? So you know, if I'm a detective and I, you know, the fact that Bree's fingerprints are on the knife are part of my evidence, then surely I I'm not doing anything wrong epistemically speaking if I you know turn to Hillary, my partner, and tell him that. Yeah, certainly, um, certainly I. I mean, I think one, one thing here is that we can distinguish different notions of permissibility. I mean, these deontic notions are context sensitive. So I'm sure we can introduce a kind of a more objective notion of permissibility on which 
um, false assertions are not permissible. But yeah, my thought is that in the, the relevantly epistemically constrained sense of permissibility, it is okay to assert things that are false so long as they're justified and justified to a pretty strong degree. That is a degree strong enough for it to be rational for you to think you know them, even if you don't. Yeah. I mean, there is that point that Williamson makes, which I, I, uh, I think is well taken that, uh, you know, you can always object to someone's assertion by saying, but you don't know that. Yes. It's the most straightforward way of objecting to what someone says. Yeah, good. One thing that I want to retain here, so although I'm not a full E equals K, I do want to retain the idea that knowledge is a kind of norm for belief and assertion in a way that I think uh, Williamson is one of the people that sort of brought this to our attention, but I want to do it in a slightly different way. So, so my idea is that in order for you to be justified in believing P or asserting P, you do at least need justification to think you're in a position to know P. So you don't actually have to be in that position, but you do at least need justification to think you're in that position. And if that's not the case, as in a lottery example, then you, you since um, you don't have justification to think you know your ticket will lose, you really shouldn't be believing it or asserting it at all. So that's at least a kind of partial concession to what I think is a, a true insight of Williamson's, even though I'm not willing to go uh, all the way to say that justification actually requires factivity. Thanks, Alex. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay. Thank you, yeah, thank you both. Um, Bree, would you like to continue with your comment? Yes, and let me um, start the slideshow. Let me first say uh, that it's a real honor to be here commenting on Declan's book and with Alex and Hillary. Uh, Declan's book is a book that I really admire. It's incredibly rigorous and challenging. And although um, I think I disagree with his basic foundational starting points, he is so uh, responsive to objections and so good at anticipating objections that I found it very challenging to criticize. Um, but I'm going to try. Okay, so his starting point is uh, thinking about ideal rationality, as he said in his summary. And ideal rationality requires, among other things, perfect coherence among attitudes and evidence. From this starting point, Declan derives ambitious, an ambitious picture of justification, beliefs, etc. My doubts about this picture concern whether it illuminates our epistemic situation. And so his approach is to sketch uh, a picture of ideal rationality and then to use that as a kind of normative anchor for our beliefs and to understand uh, the kind of things that justify us in having beliefs. And I'm concerned that the picture of ideal rationality is so demanding that in fact, it doesn't shed light on the epistemic situation of cognitively and rationally limited creatures uh, like us. And maybe to be modest, I should say like me, because it might be that one or more of you are ideally rational. So this may be um, a concern about what I can learn about my own epistemic situation from Declan's book. Okay, so uh, begin with more paradoxical beliefs. I'll call these MPBs. Uh, I'm gonna be concerned with specifically the omissive form of more paradoxical beliefs and the omissive form are beliefs of the form P, but I don't believe that P. Now Declan thinks that these beliefs are always irrational. I think that these beliefs are, I mean, this is uncontroversial actually, are self-defeating. They're self-defeating in that believing that P, but I don't believe that P, falsifies the content of that belief. So having that belief means that the belief is false. However, I don't actually think that these beliefs are always irrational. Declan argues as follows. 
Uh, he starts with the premise that more paradoxical beliefs are always irrational, and this is a very strong intuition that he has. He says it can never be rational to form false beliefs about what you believe. He thinks that the best explanation of the fact that more paradoxical beliefs are always irrational, the best explanation of that fact is that a rational thinker will know all of her beliefs. So he says rationality requires knowing what you believe, since otherwise you're liable to fall into an irrational Morian predicament. And so he concludes from this a very ambitious thesis about self-knowledge, which I've called the ubiquity of self-knowledge. And this is the claim that a rational thinker will know all of her beliefs. I have doubts about the conclusion, and I'm going to focus uh, my doubts on the first premise. I have doubts about the conclusion in part because I have doubts about the first premise. Okay, so to uh, express my doubts about the first premise, I'm going to use an example that um, is by now very familiar from Christopher Peacock. And this is an example of someone who judges that foreign degrees are as valuable as domestic degrees, yet at the same time, she recognizes or at least believes um, that when she evaluates applications, she in fact gives greater weight to domestic degrees than to foreign degrees. And Peacock suggests that this is an example where a judgment diverges from a belief. And so a belief, unlike a judgment, is a dispositional state. So to believe that P, I think, is something like, and this is Eric Schwitzgabel's view, to be disposed to act, reason, and feel as if P is the case. So beliefs are dispositional, judgments are events. There are current states, not dispositional states. So Peacock uses this example as an example to show that judgments can diverge from beliefs. Now, I'm gonna add a twist to his example. Suppose that Molly, I'm calling her Molly, reviews her rankings of applicants. This review gives her good reason to think, propositional justification for the belief that I don't believe that foreign degrees are as valuable as domestic degrees. So what she's doing when she reviews these applications is she's uh, concluding that she is disposed to act and reason as if domestic degrees are more valuable than foreign degrees. So the review of the evidence leads her to think, leads her to conclude, and justifiably so, that she doesn't actually believe that foreign degrees are as valuable as domestic degrees. I think that in this situation, she judges that foreign degrees are as valuable as domestic degrees, but also judges that she doesn't have that belief, namely she doesn't have the dispositions that constitute that belief. Now let me add one extra twist. Suppose that in fact, when she reviews the applications, the evidence that she gets from that review is misleading evidence. And this could happen in a number of ways. We could pretend that there's some nefarious agent that came and changed her rankings in between or changed the basis on which she had made her rankings. In any case, she clearly could be justified in thinking on the basis of reviewing the applications that they manifest a disposition to act and reason as if domestic degrees are more valuable than foreign degrees. So even if, in fact, her rankings do give equal weight to those degrees. So I think in this case, Molly is rational in simultaneously believing that foreign degrees are as valuable as domestic degrees and believing that she, in fact, doesn't have that belief. In fact, she is rational not only in having each uh, conjunct of that conjunctive belief, she's rational in having the conjunctive belief overall. And so we can think about what she does in acting on that belief. That is, she is disposed to act and reason as if 
these degrees are of equal value while also being disposed to act in reason as if she's not disposed to act in reason as if they're of equal value. So she might decide um, to work on herself, to work on her beliefs, to be more careful in her, her judgments um, in the way that she reasons about different applications because she might recognize that her dispositions do not fit her considered judgment, even while she in fact is disposed to treat these kinds of degrees as equally valuable. So that those are my doubts about premise one, that, that is the premise that more paradoxical beliefs are always irrational. I think that they can be quite rational. And I think that this case is an example uh, where the more paradoxical belief is rational. Now, Declan is going to, of course, reject this. And his means of rejecting this includes his conception of belief. And this is something that he uh, mentioned in his presentation earlier. On Declan's view, to believe that P is to be disposed to judge that P when you consciously entertain whether P. So if uh, believing that P uh, requires that you're disposed to judge that P when you consciously entertain that P, and if that disposition suffices for belief that P, then Molly's judgment that foreign degrees are as valuable as domestic degrees provides conclusive evidence that she believes this because that judgment on his view reveals that she is in fact disposed to have that judgment and on his view, that is sufficient for the belief that P. So if she's aware of that judgment, as Declan thinks that she will be, if she's aware of that judgment, or at least if, if awareness is, av is available to her because it's a conscious judgment, then she is justified in taking herself to believe that P. Moreover, he says that the judgment itself destroys, that's his word, destroys any evidence that she might have that she didn't believe that P. Okay. And I'm going to make a very general objection to this picture. I think that awareness that I'm now judging that P actually cannot provide conclusive evidence that I am disposed to judge that P. So in fact, I think Declan's conception of belief um, is not only unorthodox, but it doesn't capture belief in ordinary creatures like us who are not ideally rational. So I doubt whether that conception of belief tells us anything about what we can glean, what we, what kind of justification we can acquire from our conscious judgments. But I'm putting that aside for a moment and just uh, examining his proposal on his own terms. And I think that even on his own terms, we in fact cannot be justified in taking ourselves to have a disposition purely on the basis of witnessing a, a single event. And so to make this case, I'm going to talk about um, events and dispositions uh, more generally with a different familiar example of a disposition. So suppose that you have extremely good evidence that a particular vase is not fragile. So you know um, what the vase is made of and you know that, let's say, anything made of that material is incredibly unlikely to break. It's incredibly unlike to, unlikely to break, let's say, if it's dropped at a height from a height of three feet onto a concrete floor. So suppose you know that. You then, see that the, the, um, the vase is dropped from that height onto a concrete floor and it shatters. The question is, does that provide you conclusive evidence that the vase is disposed to break, that it is fragile? Does it destroy the evidence that you had to the effect that the vase was not disposed to break? I think that witnessing it breaking may lessen the amount of justification that you have for believing that it is not fragile, that it's resilient. But I do not think that it provides you conclusive evidence that it's fragile. After all, it may be a highly resilient uh, vase 
that would break only one time in a thousand when you, if you have evidence, because you know what it's made of, that that kind of thing is only likely to break one time in a thousand, then if you witness it breaking, you might think this is the one time in a thousand. In any case, you do not then have conclusive evidence that the vase is fragile. And this is a, just a very general point that awareness of a single event is not the kind of thing that could conclusively establish that there's a corresponding general disposition. But remember on Declan's view, um, a single judgment is conclusive evidence that you have the corresponding dispositional belief. And I just don't see how something that has the ontological status of an event can give you justification, let alone conclusive evidence that the corresponding disposition is true. And the reason for this is a sort of familiar Humean point that witnessing an event doesn't allow you, uh, at least in any obvious way, to infer the truth of counterfactuals and dispositions, of course, um, at least entail the truth of various counterfactuals. Okay, so in conclusion, in ideally rational creatures, dispositional beliefs will never diverge from judgments or from dispositions to judge. In ideally rational creatures, ideally rational creatures will never have more paradoxical beliefs. And for such creatures, self-knowledge may be ubiquitous. That it is, it might be that in every perfectly rational creature, that creature will know all of her beliefs. But my doubts concern what we can learn from these facts about the, the epistemic situation of creatures like us. And so I'm not sure that Declan's impressively systematic, ambitious picture of attitudes and justification illuminates our epistemic situation. And again, my focus here, what I have the deepest doubts about here, um, concern his picture of belief. So it might be that in ideally rational creatures, whenever they're disposed to act and reason as if P is the case, they're also disposed to judge that P is the case. I don't think that that's true of us. I think there are many examples that show that that's not true of us. And so my questions concern whether what he says about belief actually applies to belief in cognitively and rationally limited creatures like us. Okay, and I'll stop there. Thank you, Bri. Um, Declan, you wanna respond? Yeah, thanks so much, Bri, a terrific comment. I've learned so much from your work on self-knowledge. And I know that in the past, you've defended the rationality of believing uh, commissive Morian conjunctions like, I believe P, but it's not the case that P. Uh, and one thing that um, actually Alex has persuaded me of is that you can indeed know those conjunctions to be true. Um, you can know that P while knowing that you harbor an irrational belief that uh, not P, um, just piggybacking on, on your examples. And if you can know these conjunctions, you can rationally believe them. So I've, what I thought was that there was something uh, particularly bad about the emissive conjunction, since it can't be known. Uh, and indeed, I thought was sort of knowably unknowable. Um, so very interesting to see you develop a, you know, a powerful case that maybe these things can be rationally believed. And ultimately, I want to give a partially concessive response, not, not quite as concessive as, as, you, as you would like, I think, but, but partially concessive nonetheless. Um, um, one thing I thought I would just briefly mention is that although I do put a fair amount of weight on the classic form of Moore's paradox, there's this other argument that's maybe even more um, do, doing more heavy lifting for me, which is this worry about epistemic acrasia. So the worry in effect is this, um, suppose that you're not always in a position to know what you believe, but suppose that um, your beliefs uh, and I am supposing this, that, that all of your beliefs are part of your evidence. Um, indeed, we could sort of take that to be an epistemic criterion for something to be a genuine belief, as opposed to some merely belief-like mental representation. It's the sort of thing that contributes to your pool of evidence. So the worry is in effect, if there are 
if there are beliefs in there that you're not in a position to know, these are going to generate cases of epistemic acrasia where you're rational in believing not the kind of classic Morian conjunction P, and I don't believe P, but the sort of quasi Morian conjunction P, and I'm not justified in believing P. Um, just to mention that, but, but uh, having mentioned that, let's set it aside and focus on the, on the classic form. Um, I mean, there is a, a general worry just about the very idea that beliefs can be luminous, which, which comes out in Bree's remarks and is associated with, with the Humean point that she highlights. Now, how, how could a belief be luminous? Even if we set aside general worries about luminosity of the kind that Williamson has pushed, if we suppose concessively that our conscious experiences can be luminous, how could a belief be luminous, given that beliefs are not conscious episodes, but dispositional states? The worry in effect is that um, um, your dispositions are not luminous to you. And since beliefs are dispositions, beliefs can't be luminous. Um, so my thought here was um, basically to turn the argument on its head since, um, since I think beliefs have to be luminous. And since I agree that beliefs are dispositions, some dispositional states are luminous. But my thought was, I don't think that dispositions towards reasoning and action can be luminous. So we have grounds for excluding them from the, as it were, the profile of belief or the individuation of belief. And now we think of belief just as a disposition towards judgment. But, but I think Bree's reaction is, look, how, how does that really help? Um, just because phenomenal dispositions towards judgment themselves, you might think, are not um, introspectively luminous either. One point to, that I want to make here is that, on my view, what gives you the introspective reason to think you have the belief is actually not the occurring judgment, but rather the disposition towards judgment. So it's the, it's the fact that you believe that P that gives you the introspective reason to believe that you believe that P. So, so interestingly, it's not actually the manifestation of that disposition in conscious judgment but the dispositional state itself that gives you the reason. Um, and um, that, that certainly wouldn't fit well with certain ways of thinking about introspection on which the importance of consciousness is, for example, to kind of illuminate the items on, a, on an inner stage. Um, but in any case, um, um, I basically agree with Bree that an act of conscious judgment could never give you a conclusive reason to believe that you have the dispositional belief. But my view is that the presence of the dispositional belief itself gives you the, um, gives you the conclusive reason. How's that supposed to work? I mean, here's the rough picture. If you're rational and you believe that P, well, then you're disposed to judge P. But if you're disposed to judge P, you're also disposed to judge, I believe P. And in being disposed to judge that you believe that P, you thereby believe that you believe that P. So it's a kind of Shoemakerian picture on which, given that you're rational, the dispositions towards judging P that constitute your first order belief partially constitute these second order dispositions to judge that you believe that P, which constitute your second order beliefs. Now, Brie has worries about the whole picture of belief, I think, reasonably, and she, she gives, she puts pressure on these. So um, is a disposition to judge the P really enough for believing that P? Um, Brie, I wanted to talk about your Felix example. Do you, do you want to sketch that one or, or should I? Um, um, I would be happy to, yes. I, so I had sent Declan a, a rough draft of my comments, but of course I cut out some for this presentation. Okay, so let me think. So uh, Felix, uh, so Felix's son, Felix Jr. has been accused of a terrible crime. When Felix reviews the evidence, he understandably pays more attention to the exculpatory evidence, even though that's very slight, very uh, weak, and ignores or discounts the importance of the evidence that seems to point to Felix Jr.'s guilt. Okay, so in this case, Felix judges Felix Jr. is guilty. Now, consistent with that, it might be that Felix actually behaves in ways that seem to suggest that he believes 
that he's guilty. I said guilty, sorry. He judges Felix Jr. as innocent. He behaves in ways that suggest that he believes Felix Jr. is guilty. So for example, he doesn't let Felix Jr. babysit his younger siblings as he usually does, et cetera. Now, he may realize that um, in fact, although I'm judging that he's innocent, my behavior suggests that I might think that he's guilty. So he might then return and force himself to look carefully at the evidence and to see whether he can shift his dispositions. At some point, he might think that his dispositions have shifted when in fact they haven't yet shifted. So he might think that, oh, I'm now disposed to treat him as innocent when in fact he isn't yet disposed to treat him as innocent or the other way around, he might think I've been treating him as innocent and I'm now disposed to treat him as guilty when in fact his dispositions haven't quite shifted yet because he is sort of self-consciously in an attached way working on shifting his dispositions. And his reasons for thinking that his dispositions have shifted when in fact they haven't might come from a therapist or a psychological examination of some sort. Okay, okay yeah, thanks, Bree. Yeah. Yeah, so th and this is a terrific example and really Bree's using it for two separate purposes. So one purpose is to put pressure on this account of belief as a disposition towards judgment because, um, at least it's plausible to think that, so when Felix is judging that his son is innocent, my theory seems to predict that he just straightforwardly believes his son is innocent. And commonsensically, it's not entirely clear that that's the right verdict. There's some pressure to say he doesn't really believe that. Um, so one thing to say here is that I do think he believes it. That is, I think that's true, but, and we need it to explain why he maintains his son's innocent and campaigns on his behalf. But I do see the pressure to say he doesn't wholeheartedly believe it. I guess what I'm inclined to say is that um, the fact that he has these contrary behavioral dispositions is some evidence that he's got a repressed disposition to, to judgment, um, in which case the right thing to say is that he has inconsistent beliefs, so even, even by the lights of my proposal. So although he would have the belief, he wouldn't wholeheartedly believe it. Maybe that's what we mean when we say he doesn't really believe it because he's, he's conflicted in this way. Um, but then, so, so in effect, this comes out in Bree's elaboration on the example. So we're, we're to imagine that Felix reassesses the evidence and as I think of it, this kind of repressed disposition comes out and Felix finally acknowledges, yeah, my, my son is guilty. But his therapist convinces him that he doesn't believe it because he doesn't have sufficiently stable dispositions, uh, right? Um, so what to say about that? Um, it's a little trick. I, mean, I think this is a really hard issue. I think it's an instance of the very general problem of misleading higher order evidence. And suppose my worry in, in short is this, if we really take this kind of worry seriously, it's gonna show that not only are beliefs not luminous, but, but nothing is luminous. Um, and then that um, epistemic acrasia is sometimes rational after all. So here, here's an effect of my thought. Um, suppose your therapist, you, you're, you're saying you feel pain and your therapist is telling you that your depression is causing you to mistake what's really mild discomfort for pain. Uh, you can sort of see that the way you might elaborate this line of argument in a way to threaten the idea that even feelings of pain are luminous. And I think this is basically what Eric Schwitzkabel is doing in his arguments against the, against the reliability of introspection, sort of appealing to considerations of disagreement and uncertainty and putting pressure on the idea that we have this sort of special kind of access even to current ongoing conscious experience. My story about higher order evidence is a little bit complicated, but in short, my idea is that it doesn't affect what you have ideal, what is ideally rational for you to believe. It doesn't affect what your evidence supports, but it does sometimes make it advisable for you to take your limitations into account in managing your evidence. And so this is the sort of point of partial concession brief. What I'm probably gonna end up saying is that it is non-ideally rational in some of these cases for you to believe even emissive Morian conjunctions, but I'm gonna maintain that it's not rational by ideal standards. Um, 
but this will probably take us back to your questions about um, how the notion of ideal rationality really bears on the human predicament. Uh, so, so maybe I can turn it back to you. And um... Right, and um, I haven't seen Hillary's comments, but I wouldn't be surprised if they touched on this theme as well. I've learned a lot from his work on this issue. Um, so yeah, so I would just then ask the question. So you, you brought up the shoemaker kind of move where if I'm disposed um, to judge that P, then I'm disposed to judge that I judge that P. And again, my way of thinking of those sorts of things is to say, look, if someone had their dispositions linked in that way, that might be partly const constitutive of what it is to be rational. But it's a different question whether we in fact have the, those dispositions linked in those ways. And so even if, you know, rationally speak, if we were perfectly rational, we would. And even if you and I can sort of endorse something like that, so that if in cases where those dispositions are linked, we can say, great, rationally, that's at least a plus, right? Even if that's the case, it's a different thing to say that for any being that's capable of rationality, which we are capable of rationality in the sense that we can make rational inferences, we can distinguish rational from irrational inferences, any being capable of rational of rationality will be built that way. That is, we'll only have the disposition to judge that P when they have the disposition to judge that they judge the P. And so, yes, that's exactly my concern is that the appeal to relations like that is going to um, limit your account in ways that I think mean that it may not shed light on our epistemic situation. Yeah, thanks, Bree. I mean, I, I definitely think there are examples that fit the kind of description you're giving. So here's one. Suppose you have inconsistent beliefs. Suppose you believe P and at the same time believe not P. On my theory, ideal rationality requires that you believe that you believe a contradiction. But of course, no ideally rational agent would ever believe that they believe a contradiction because no ideally rational agent would believe a contradiction in the first place. So I don't want to collapse what ideal rationality requires that you believe into what an ideally rational agent would believe. I, that I think cannot work for these sorts of general reasons. What I need to, uh, what I hope to defend is the thought that um, believing a Morian conjunction is always less than ideally rational, um, not just in the sense that an ideally rational agent wouldn't do it, but that it's never supported by your evidence. Um, uh, but at least it, there's yeah. subtlety here, there's difficulty yeah. here. Yeah, I see that. Okay, thank you. Um, last but not least, Hillary. Please, go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, uh, like the other speakers, I'm uh, delighted to be here. Uh, thanks so much for the invitation and delighted to be commenting on uh, Declan's um, just uh, remarkably original and uh, challenging book. Uh, I'm going to focus as uh, pre-predicted uh, in ways that are um, uh, at a, at a certain level of abstraction, uh, quite similar to kinds of issues which she has brought up, but I'm going to focus uh, on the chapter on reflection. Um, so here's what uh, Declan says in that chapter that he's going to offer us an hypothesis about justification. Um, he says, we use the concept of justification because of its connection with the practice of reflection on the epistemic credentials of our beliefs. According to, <laughs> my office has uh, motion detectors and turns off the lights if I don't move periodically. So if you see me jumping up and waving my arms, it's not because of some uh, neural event as the neurologists say, <laughs> but in order to get the lights to come back on. So according to this hypothesis, uh, Declan says, Justification is the epistemic property that makes our beliefs stable under uh, reflection. So 
this way of thinking about justification, connecting it in this very deep way to uh, our practice of reflecting on our beliefs, this is uh, certainly a familiar tradition in epistemology and one which um, I, I have to confess, I mean, I think, you know, pre-theoretically there's something awfully appealing about this way of uh, thinking of things. I mean, certainly um, you see uh, this way of thinking about things in Descartes, uh, you see it uh, in Hume. Um, uh, more recently, you see it in um, uh, Dick Foley's uh, way of uh, thinking about the nature of justification. It's an attractive uh, idea about what justification is all about. We certainly do at times stop to reflect on our beliefs, even if it's true that the overwhelming majority of our beliefs are formed unreflectively. But when we um, stop to reflect, we're assessing um, the epistemic standing of our beliefs. You might think that's where the very notion of justification even comes from. But apart from that kind of um, hypothesis about its um, origin or motivation, um, you might think with Declan that there is some essential connection between the property of being justified and something about um, uh, reflection itself. There's a variant of this idea, um, a kind of socialized version of it. I mean, uh, Declan's version isn't the social version, um, but that what justification is, is not a matter of standing up to challenges from within um, that we find on reflection, but that justification being justified is a matter of standing up to challenges that arise um, from our community. Um, you see this socialized version uh, arguably in Wittgenstein, you see it in uh, Sellers, in Brandom, in uh, Mike Williams, uh, in short, in the, uh, the Pittsburgher Schule. Um, what both the social version and the individual version uh, have in common is this idea that justification is a matter of standing up uh, to challenges of a certain sort. It's a kind of dialectical uh, conception of what it is to be justified in holding a belief. And it's important to see that if you've got that kind of dialectical view about what it is to be justified, you're offering a deeply subjective view about what justification amounts to. So it's easiest to see in the social case. I mean, you know, if you inhabit a, um, a scientific community, then you might think, oh, okay, responding to the challenges that arise in my epistemic community, and that really is what justification is all about. But of course, there are lots of other epistemic communities which one might inhabit. There are ones um, uh, that resolve uh, questions about what to believe by appealing to a guru or some sacred text. And some epistemic communities are, you know, deeply wacky. Um, and if one's got this, you know, dialectical conception that what it is to be justified is to be able to respond to the challenges that arise within one's community, um, then um, uh, one ends up with a conception of justification um, that uh, departs from any reasonable objective conception of what it is to be justified in one's beliefs. And the thing is, of course, you know, going individualistic, um, as the Cartesian tradition does, um, it doesn't really solve that problem. Because of course, um, not you or I, but lots of individuals themselves are pretty wacky. And when they, you know, reflect on uh, their beliefs, their deepest epistemic standards um, uh, are uh, themselves ones which uh, depart from any uh, reasonable um, objective conception of uh, what it is to be, uh, to hold a belief in uh, a reasonable way. So, um, the, you know, dialectical conception and any kind of reasonable objective conception um, seem to uh, come apart. Hence, um, you know, the debate between internalists and externalists. There are deep intuitions on uh, both sides here. And um, of course, 
Descartes thought that, you know, he could uh, resolve this problem. I mean, he could show how his uh, subjective conception inevitably uh, matches up with the objective conception. Uh, God helped out uh, with that. Um, but um, uh, one of the striking things about um, Declan's view is um, he too uh, wants to uh, suggest that um, this appeal to um, reflection and um, the standards that flow from it does not result in some kind of uh, radically subjective conception of uh, justification. Uh, that in fact, um, it's going to give him uh, uh, some kind of objectivity. And the question is, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, Declan's going to do it without God's help. Um, and so the question is, how are you going to do that? How are you going to pull that off? Um, that would really be to uh, square the circle and, you know, resolve the issue between uh, internalists and objective and uh, uh, externalists so that you can really have both at the same time, as it were. Um, okay. So, um, All right. Declan says that um, the reason we stop to reflect, our goal in reflecting is this. He says, the aim of this activity is to bring our beliefs into line with our higher order reflections about which beliefs we have justification to hold. And it seems to me that's, that that can't be right. Um, uh, I mean, this common view, we see very much the same suggestion in uh, uh, Chris Korsgaard about the goal of reflecting on our beliefs. But look, I mean, all of us are familiar with uh, other people who have stopped to reflect on their beliefs and have brought their beliefs in line with their deepest convictions about how they ought to believe um, and who have ended up in a very, very bad place. Um, They've uh, ended up with uh, what Emerson so colorfully calls a, a foolish consistency, uh, the hobgoblin of little minds. Um, we see other people get themselves into this self-satisfied situation. And we ourselves don't want to be in that situation. Merely getting ourselves to the point where we've got a kind of internal consistency, whether it's objectively um, has any objective bearing on what the world is like is really not our goal. Um, our goal in reflecting, maybe um, we see um, getting some kind of um, internal uh, uh, consistency, uh, some kind of reflective equilibrium as a means to our goal, or at least with any luck, uh, it will be a means uh, to our goal. But surely the, the epistemic goal is um, getting beliefs which are, um, uh, which are true. Um, and we think um, that with any luck, um, by reflecting on our beliefs and bringing them in line with our standards, we're more likely to achieve that goal. But we shouldn't um, mistake the means for the ends here. Um, merely achieving some kind of reflective equilibrium um, uh, is uh, is not the goal of reflective activity. Um, it's not the ultimate goal of reflective activity. Um, okay. Um, now, the kinds of worries I have about appeals to reflection uh, stem from this. I mean, look, the epistemic tradition is just filled with um, a rich awareness of the extent to which beliefs unreflectively arrived at um, might actually uh, not be uh, even close to right. We form beliefs unreflectively all the time. Maybe, you know, that's um, something that works out well for us a lot, but it sometimes works out uh, very badly. Um, and uh, the thought is, look, we shouldn't just go with the flow. We shouldn't just sit on our duffs and let our um, 
unselfconscious belief acquisition procedures rip and take us wherever they, they might. Um, it's not responsible to do that. Uh, we need to stop and uh, reflect. But the thing is, I mean, much as the epistemological tradition has a rich awareness of the way in which unreflective belief can uh, go wrong, that it's, even if it does work pretty well, it uh, doesn't work perfectly. Certainly, it's also true that our reflective processes don't work perfectly. Um, and indeed, when you look at the um, empirical work on, um, uh, on reflection, what one sees is that uh, reflecting on the epistemic standing of our beliefs um, uh, gives a rise to all sorts of uh, illusions, um, uh, makes us often um, quite content with uh, our beliefs, whatever they might be. There's um, the phenomenon of confabulation, which um, uh, gives rise to um, uh, a kind of contentment with whatever it is that we already believe. And, the illusion that we believe it on the basis of um, uh, things that we ourselves would take um, uh, to justify us, even if that wasn't in fact and isn't in fact the reason for which we believe these things. Um, one can uh, exaggerate uh, the problems with reflection. Uh, it would be a mistake to suggest that reflection never um, is effective in uh, getting us to the truth. Uh, Declan, um, uh, surveys some of that literature as well, but um, uh, he doesn't deny, and, and, and of course no one should, um, that reflection is more than just fallible, um, that it often leads us to make um, quite substantial mistakes. The way reflection works in human beings is not across the board reliable, let alone infallible. So why should we identify being justified with following the dictates of reflection, given that the dictates of reflection are, you know, sometimes good, sometimes bad, in the same way that just following the dictates of the native processes of unreflected belief acquisition are often very good, but sometimes quite bad. Um, um, and here's where Declan says, you know, look, I've got to idealize a bit here. <laughs> I can't just go with reflection as it actually is, right? So um, what he says is a, a justified belief is one that's stable under reflection that is itself justified, okay? Not just stable under reflection as it actually exists in human beings, but reflection is stable under justified reflection. So there's some kind of idealization going on here. And the question is, where do these standards of idealization come from? Um, I mean, if the thought is that we can lay out certain kinds of objective criteria that will define when reflection is done right, and these might come from reliability, they might come from um, um, some kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, appeal to um, probability, um, uh, but some kind of objective standard, not an objective standard that actual reflection meets, but that's externally imposed. If we're going to do that, then why not just appeal to that objective standard to begin with and leave reflection out of the picture? I mean, if we know, if there is some objective constraint on what's justified, and we're going to bring that to bear on the actual practice of reflection, which you know wouldn't lead us to justification. Um, why not just skip the appeal to reflection entirely and go straight for that external standard? Um, more than that, I mean, the appeal to reflection not only seems unnecessary, but seems now deeply misleading, because reflection, as it actually exists in us, 
is not something which can do the kind of job that Declan, you know, needs it to do. What's needed is something objective. Uh, what's needed is something which, I mean, in fact, on Declan's view, is inf infallible with respect to certain things. Um, and no human psychological process uh, is or could be of that sort. So um, I think that um, uh, there are real uh, worries here about how reflection could possibly set the standard uh, for justified belief um, um, and uh, be the kind of objective thing that uh, Declan and I agree is really needed for uh, a conception of justification worth worrying about. Um, and more than that, since this is supposed to illuminate both um, the notion of justification itself but also illuminate the phenomenon of reflection, how this idealized conception of reflection could have any bearing on the very human phenomenon which we seem to be discussing from the beginning, the one that you, know, you and I have a tendency to engage in periodically in order to examine our beliefs, um, which we think, even I think, um, can sometimes be um, uh, an epistemically good thing uh, to engage in, uh, suitably constrained. Um, it's not clear to me how um, this can illuminate either of those phenomena. So let me just stop there. Thank you. Tiklan, the last response. <laughs> Hilary, thanks so much for those uh, challenging questions. Hilary and I um, had a conversation about his book uh, on reflection, and so it's a, a really a privilege to basically continue that conversation with him here. Um, I wanted to just start by trying to sort of put the big picture that I have out there to sort of help to explain this obsession of mine with, with reflection. Why, why is that playing such a central role? I think it's really coming from this um, what in a way is one of the driving ideas of the book that epistemic acrasia is irrational. Um, so just as it's irrational to do things that you believe you shouldn't do, so it's irrational to believe things you, should, you think you shouldn't believe. Um, if that's right, it means there can't be a belief that's justified um, while you also have justification to believe upon reflection that it's unjustified. Otherwise, um, you could have justification to be epistemically acratic, to hold a belief while at the same time thinking you should give it up. Um, and similarly, there can't be a belief that's unjustified, although you have justification to believe on reflection, it is justified, because then you'd have justification to believe, again, this sort of, this acratic conjunction, I should believe P, but it's not the case that P, or maybe it's an open question whether P. Um, so the hypothesis is that a belief is justified if and only if it has what it takes to survive reflection that's also justified. Um, so this biconditional isn't much use as a analysis of justification since the notion is reappearing on the right hand side. We're not getting anything like a kind of reductive account of what it is for a belief to be justified. Is it completely vacuous? I don't think so because it's giving us this sort of, is building in and effect this substantive commitment to a JJ principle. Um, so just to sort of bring out the idea that, that what I'm really after here is sort of ruling out the rationality of epistemic acrasia. Hillary raises a, what is in effect a really nice dilemma, objective or, or subjective. So I wanted to, to try to say something about this to again, bring out the sort of general orientation of the proposal. On my view, the, the standards of epistemic justification are not completely subjective. It's not enough for justification that your beliefs survive reflection by your own standards, but for basically the reason that Hillary gives, your standards might be completely wacky. And I think this is really, this, this is a fairly standard objection to Foley's version of this idea, which doesn't um, have the element of objectivity that I'm hoping for. So, so my account's not subjective in that way. It's also not completely objective in the sense that the standards of epistemic justification are distinct from the standards of truth or accuracy. But I think that's true of pretty much any theory of justification, even a reliabilist theory or a knowledge first 
theory is going to allow that sometimes you have justification to believe things that are false or that your evidence can support things that are false. Um, admittedly, I have a sort of particular version of that idea. It's, it's, it is an internalist version and it's an evidentialist uh, version. Um, so, um, but on my version of this, there are objective standards of justification, but they're evidential standards. So um, you've got to believe what your evidence supports. And there are objective standards of evidential support, but, and here's the crucial thing, your, your evidence can be misleading. And so that's going to allow for some discrepancy between justification and truth. Um, now, so far, there's nothing very original about this picture. This so far just sounds like a standard um, evidentialist picture. Um, and on a certain way of understanding this evidentialism, we can think of these objective standards of evidential support as requiring coherence, maybe logical coherence or probabilistic coherence. So what I see as being the distinctive twist is that um, I also think the evidential support relation requires not just coherence, but metacoherence. In effect, uh, this mesh between your first order and higher order beliefs. Um, and so my thought is that if we don't bring reflection into the picture, we, we, we lose sight of these metacoherence knobs. And, and indeed, I sort of my sense from the literature, if you look at the, my closest allies, the internalist evidentialists, it seems to me that this idea has been lost sight of. So people talk about the idea that your beliefs should co cohere with your perceptual appearances. Some of them talk about the idea that your beliefs should respect logic, but very few uh, really highlight this idea that your first order and higher order beliefs should, should hang together. So, so the idea is objective standards of evidential support, but they have this kind of higher order structure to them. I, do, I wanted to say to Hillary that I have some sympathy with his complaints about the way I stated the goal of reflection. It seems too fetishistic the way I said it. Um, and um, my friend David Barnett at the University of Toronto has been uh, pushing me on a similar point. Um, I think that's I think that's right. Um, I think there's a similar point about reasoning. So what's the point of reasoning? It would be wrong to say the goal of reasoning is to trace out the consequences of your beliefs. Because uh, first of all, the starting points might be irrational. And secondly, it's fetishistic to so focus on the patterns of your beliefs without thinking about what's true. The goal is really to get at the truth. I wanna concede that point, Hillary. I think I can restate what I was after in a slightly better way. Um, so as we're evaluating people's pursuit of this goal of truth, um, we can evaluate them for whether they're rational in their pursuit of the goal, uh, where these evaluations of truth and rationality can come apart. And I, I guess my claim is that for, for reflection to be rational, you need these two things. Your higher order beliefs need to be rational and your, your lower order beliefs need to be conformed to those rational higher order beliefs. And my hope is that um, putting the point in this way can avoid the, the sort of slightly fetishistic um, quality of the, the way I stated the goal beforehand. Um, but maybe the last thing I should I'll hand it back to you, Hillary, but just on this point about idealization, because I think it, in many ways that this is one of the sort of deep issues raised by the book and by a number of the um, exchanges here. Um, what emerges is that I'm thinking of idealization in this sort of very demanding uh, and normative sense. So there's a notion of idealization on which reflection is ideal when it functions in optimal conditions construed as conditions in which there's no distortion or interference from outside. So roughly speaking, if there were no interference and distortion, you would function ideally. There's a different notion, a normative notion of idealization that I'm appealing to, which is that reflection is ideal when it satisfies the most demanding standards of epistemic rationality. And one thing I allow myself is that these notions of idealization can come apart. And there's, a, I think, a real question about whether that's OK. So I'm thinking that there might be standards of epistemic rationality that apply to us, even though it's not true that were we in optimal conditions, conditions free of um, distraction and interference, we would satisfy those conditions. So one, one big question is, is it okay to think of the standards of epistemic justification in this demanding way? I'm inclined to think so, 
But I wonder if dis the disagreement about that might go some way to explaining disagreements that lie elsewhere. Yeah, I wonder if I could um, just respond for, uh, briefly. Um, actually, not so much a response as an attempt to put the disagreement between um, Declan on the one hand and um, not only me, but also Alex and, and Bree on the other in a, a much broader perspective. Um, the other day I, I uh, went <laughs> to a talk <laughs> the extent that any of us go anywhere these days. Um, David Christensen gave um, the Sosa lecture at the American Philosophical Association. And David began his talk um, just by remarking that he was going to talk about rationality um, and uh, not talk about knowledge at all. And, and then he stopped for a second, he called himself and he said, you know, come to think of it, I really never thought anything about knowledge in my entire career. All I've ever thought about is um, uh, the notion of rationality. And um, that really gave me pause. Um, um, made me think, there are two kinds of epistemologists in this world. <laughs> there are those who think about rationality or justification, um, or at least start that way. I mean, David <laughs> you know, uh, uh, modestly says, oh, I've never gotten to the point of thinking about knowledge. Um, um, there are those, Williamson obviously, um, the most striking who start uh, with knowledge and then um, think about justification, uh, if at all, later. Um, the Bayesians, of course, typically begin by um, thinking about, you know, rationality or ideal rationality. Um, in fact, many of them, um, uh, as with David, are, you know, not um, particularly interested in the notion of knowledge. And then there, um, uh, but even people who are interested in both justification and knowledge, some start with the justification and some start with the knowledge end. And I think what we're seeing is that all of the commentators here seem to be very much interested in, I think, starting at the knowledge end. I mean, it was clear in Alex's um, remarks, but I think Bree's remarks um, as well, though it didn't explicitly take a stand on that, the focus on, you know, actual human agents instead of thinking of um, these extraordinary ideal conditions as uh, the kind of justification that we really want to examine, um, I think is naturally put in a kind of um, knowledge first context where you think, look, we're all, no skeptics here. <laughs> um, we all think there's an awful lot of knowledge. If you think knowledge requires justification, then the standards required for justification must be ones that are very frequently met. And now the notion of justification that we're interested in cannot possibly be these hyper idealized um, notions of justification. And more than that, they've got to make contact with, the, uh, in general, the kinds of actual psychological powers, um, whether they be of reflection, um, um, of capacity to recognize one's own beliefs, of capacity to um, uh, engage in actually any kind of serious attempt to get one's beliefs inferentially integrated. I mean, given the size of our body of beliefs, um, there's only so much we can take into account at any um, one time. And I think the notions of um, justification that one ends up with, even if, you know, even if one's interested in justification, but starts at the knowledge end, are going to look very different from the notions of justification that one gets if one starts at the justification and, and thinks about ideal justification or rationality, ideal rationality. Um, and I think these ways of thinking about epistemological questions are often really deep in the background um, when any of us uh, start thinking about uh, epistemological issues um, and um, bringing them out in front as um, uh, some people um, have done recently, um, uh, might be particularly important in um, trying to uh, get some 
uh, grip on the relationship between uh, what uh, these two very different traditions in the epistemological community are all about and the extent to which they can uh, profitably engage with one another. So uh, I just wanted to leave it there rather than directly uh, respond to uh, to Declan's remarks. Yeah, no, that's fascinating, Hillary. I mean, so maybe there are sort of two sets of issues that that I think do in, intersect. So one is, are you are you knowledge first, or perhaps belief first, versus credence first? And another issue is, um, you know, how friendly are you to idealization? Um, what's interesting is that I've always thought of myself actually as a pretty belief first, knowledge first kind of a person, but also I'm an idealizer. And it's at least not immediately obvious why you can't do those both, do both of those things. Although I think there is pressure here. Um, in particular, there's the thought that, hey, if you're ideally rational, why do you even have the need for beliefs? Indeed, why, why would you ever believe anything other than what was absolutely certain since you can make do with credences elsewhere. So, so I do think there are, there are deep questions there. But I, I guess I wanted to say this. Um, a number, one thing that's coming out of the exchange is that someone like me that puts a lot of work on idealization needs an account of what this has to do with us. How does it link up with human evaluation? Um, in the book, what I say is that, well, there's rationality by ideal standards and there's rationality by non-ideal standards. But what we really need is more of a story about the connection. And it's not really a story that I offer in the book in it, certainly in any detail. It is something that I'm hoping to work on uh, in future. I have a, a draft on that right now. But I suppose I just wanted to end by saying, I think there's a challenge even for the knowledge first to, to say something. Here. So take someone like Williamson who thinks, um, your evidence is your knowledge. And so the, the invited person or the person in the skeptical scenario who forms these beliefs, on this view, then those beliefs are not justified. So what the knowledge first typically says is there's some sense in which, although they are not proportioned to your evidence and so not rational by ideal standards, they're not ideally rational, they're reasonable. Um, and, uh, and so what you find is that people like Williamson and Maria Lisson and Arneo and, and Alex will then tell a story at that point um, about what it is for these beliefs to have this secondary epistemic status. And it turns out that the kind of account that I wanna give of non-ideal rationality is structurally exactly the same. So that it seems to me the real disagreement is not do we need two normative notions, an ideal notion of proportioning your beliefs to the evidence and a non-ideal notion of maybe doing the best you can at that, uh, or manifesting generally good dispositions um, of that kind. Um, the real disagreement has to do with the nature of evidence presupposed in that account. Um, but certainly, Hillary, that there are many deep issues about epistemic idealization that are being raised here, and I completely agree with your point that um, that's where at least some of the, the action is here. Yeah. Great. Okay. So thank you everyone for your valuable contributions and thank you Declan for giving us the chance to comment on your book. Um, our viewers have the chance to also leave us a comment in the comment section below. And if you wanna stay tuned on future sessions of Laws Per Meets Critics or other events by concept, then please visit our website. I will also link that below. And of course, we will leave a link to the book we just discussed. <laughs> and um, yeah, I hope to see you all soon. And thank you. Bye bye.